we've had some pretty large rooms in the past. This one is not as, um, we don't have as many attendees today as we normally do, but um, so the council's decided to set some rules uh, just so we can make sure that everybody has a chance to talk during these sessions. So if you can keep your questions or comments to three to five minutes, uh, Council Member McCoy will raise a paper when you're kind of getting to that point. And four minutes and, and then, then five, I'll put it down and that means wrapped up. And then what we want to do is get through everyone who has a question or a comment before we go back to someone else who um, has a, a secondary question or comment. Um, Council members, take it away and I'll be in the back somewhere if you need me. Hi everybody. Um, uh, what I, I hope we can do with this nice orderly uh, row is we can, you know, just go back and forth from the front to the back. Um, so don't be shy. If you have a question, raise your hand early so we know you're there. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, this afternoon, I'm really I'm morning. Kind of getting right. <laughs> That's not a good sign. <laughs> and so. Uh, Appreciate you coming out and, and, uh, and letting us know where you stand on things and uh, what the hot issue is with you. So, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand this off to Jeff here. Jeff, what are you doing? Oh, oh, can we go? Oh, okay. All right. Okay, so. We'll go ahead and stand up and we'll turn off the power or do something like that. Okay. But, all right. Well, hello everybody. My name is Jeff Lindroth and I've uh, lived in Longmont for 57 years. Um, starting off, I'm going to stay. I don't rush into things, but I'm a long time resident, we might say. And I just wanted to make everyone, including our, our fine members here, aware that uh, there is a a weightlifting, an outdoor weightlifting facility on North Main, uh, 1610 North Main, is in the parking lot of the old Big Five Sporting Goods store. And the reason I've chosen this venue to sort of raise a little bit of awareness is that uh, there's an individual uh, who has just made extraordinary effort to stand this thing up. Um, the business community has donated over $10,000 worth of equipment. And so the first thing I wanted to do was invite anyone and everyone who is interested to just stop by and visit the place. The daily hours are 7.30 a.m. to 11, and then 3.30 until 7. And the other reason that I think this venue is very appropriate is that um, I'm, a, I'm a business consultant. Uh, I have a fair amount of financial acumen that's been my profession. And so I am helping this gentleman who has stood this up. His name is King Penny. And uh, I'm helping him with some of the uh, concerns that are more of the long-term concerns of what are the money flows because he's not charging anybody. He's not charging anybody for his time. He wants this to be a free thing for people to experience working out outdoors. And uh, so that's my role in this uh, is his helper in, in this way. And so what I had told him and he agrees is that the long-term destination that he aspires, and I join him in this aspiration for this location, is to be on city property somewhere because he's paying a substantial amount of rent right now without income. He's also paying insurance, and these are you know, necessities to keep this thing operating. And so for it to be sustainable, uh, what we want to do over time is make the case to the city of Longmont, hey, this is a valuable thing. Lots of people are appreciating it. And toward that end, I can tell you that we have about 15 to 25 visitors every day that are coming. Uh, and that number is growing, has grown very quickly. It's only been open for about seven weeks now. And uh, I have a little presentation, not that, uh, to give today, but I've, I've been working on a presentation to submit to the city council. And one of the things that was on it was that a week ago it had 110 followers on Facebook and now it has 183 just to give you an idea of the groundswell of support. The second thing I want to make clear about this is that, you know, anytime you create a public good, there's a concern about how does it affect the community, the private landowners and the residents in the area. And I'm delighted to tell you that this has been uh, extremely well received. 
uh, the local residents not only are coming, they are volunteering their time because they view this as a really a positive thing in the neighborhood. It's not noisy, uh, but it is very interesting. And um, people who haven't worked out are working out outside and they're discovering that as an, you know, another important element of fitness. And so uh, for the city of Longmont, this is not what I would call a big deal. Um, I reviewed the open forum uh, video from January and I have noted that council is dealing with some very big deals, affordable housing, uh, homelessness, uh, child care, all kinds of big issues. Um, the reason that this particular issue is so attractive you know, to me as a financial person who thinks about return on investment is the heavy lifting, pardon the pun, I can't resist, the heavy lifting has been done by this gentleman, King Penny. The equipment's in place and the businesses that have contributed have done the heavy lifting. And at some point in the future, we, we don't have a good idea of when um, there will be a, an appropriate time for the, for the city to very seriously consider this thing as something that is a low risk item that costs the city not very much, nothing to take it over in you know, a relatively very low operating cost on an existing recreational property. And it's a very unique thing. There are only about four cities we've been able to locate that have done this in the United States, and they've done it very successfully. And so this is my hope that, um, that this will be adopted, and I'm, I'm available now to take questions, or afterward, if anybody wants to ask me more details on yeah. I have a question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, uh, I wonder whether King has, uh, since he, you say he's, he's paying liability insurance yes. now. That's correct. Um, and since he does have other uh, public venues for this, maybe uh, his presentation can include the differential um, that a private business pays in liability versus a municipality uh, would be forced to pay in liability. Thank you for that question. Uh, that is a question that I am endeavoring to get answered in the documentation that council you can expect to receive. We're going to try to get it a week in advance so that people who would be interested, my members who would be interested to review it, would be able to have time to review it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, as uh, uh, we, uh, a couple of you uh, came in after we announced the rules, you get five minutes. Uh, you're welcome to take less than that if you just want to ask a question. And we're going to try to go uh, front to back. Uh, since we have a nice orderly organization here, and that way we'll be sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. And then after that, if you have follow-on questions, you can speak again. So and, and I guess we just want one other thing, and that is uh, just your name so that we can write down and see who we're talking to, and uh, your address here for uh, enrollment. Thank you. Question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Clay Richmond. We live in uh, um, so we, we um, after the incident that you witnessed with Mike stealing, we decided that we weren't going to give out the mic, so I will repeat the question. And All right, I want to say as an advocate for the deaf that that is unacceptable because I can't hear 90% of what is said even if you receive even if you repeat the question. And so I will be addressing this further. It's okay, not acceptable. Well, let's slow, slow down. Uh, slower roll on this. What do we? Uh, what is our position, our city manager, uh, about ADA accommodating? Um, last time we were repeating the questions. Um, but, but I think she's getting at the, the the people that might make statements. Yeah, um, and I am willing, for my part, to give up the mic um, as long as everybody understands that when your five minutes are up, so is your time holding the mic. And um, <laughs> I'm serious, this happened. Uh, so yeah, I'll lock the mic. Thank you. My name is, my name is, right in there. My name is Clay Richmond. And I just want to commend the city for, this is a change of subject, but anyway, I called in probably about six months ago over a little section of sidewalk, concrete sidewalk, that wasn't complete. And the city did that, uh, oh gosh, I think it was early April when we had some uh, non-freezing weather. And it looks really good, so it's a, 
100 feet or 110 feet of four foot wide sidewalk. So I'd like to commend the city for doing that. And that's all I have for right now. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's really nice to, to hear good feedback like that. I'll have to say they did a great job on my sidewalk too. <laughs> Marcia, we heard we can pass this one around. Okay. If you just want to pass it, everybody can. If you just want to pass it, and and everybody who has a question can can um, speak when the mic comes by them. And we'll or I can just take it. Okay. Yeah, that that was probably. So my name is Anna Rebus and I live in a 4501 Nelson Road um, and I wanted to ask about, well it's kind of the opposite about what Jeff was talking about, um, the rec center that's being proposed for the Dry Creek area, which is the opposite. It's going to be a very big noisy facility that's actually going to destroy the outdoor area that people really are enjoying right now. And I've been talking to quite a few of the neighbors that I kind of encounter as I'm there, and they really enjoy going for their walks there. And just being out, they, you know, somebody referred to it like as a sanctuary. So it would be the total opposite to have this huge facility in the parking lot being built there that reduces access in many cases to the neighbors because now you have to actually pay to actually go into the facility and use the equipment, whereas now, kids, you know, all the neighbors, anybody can just walk their bike, uh, go for a walk, walk their dogs, ride their bikes, just enjoy nature for totally free. Um, and also, I was just reading an article that had to do with um, policies that a lot of cities have regarding when new buildings go in place about the minimum parking requirements. So all the area, the land that's actually used to build parking spots, and that is kind of a you know, I envision that a 90,000 square foot rec building would require a lot of parking spots. Um, so now you're paving over, a, you know, a lot of that beautiful area that people really enjoy walking in. And creating that kind of parking, um, that's kind of a really, in that neighborhood it would be necessary because there's no, I mean, it's kind of surrounded by houses and, and neighborhoods. People don't want people Oh, and cars park clogging up all the uh, their driveways and areas, and it just seems counter to what we need to be doing now, which is trying to preserve some of the land and cut down on cars. And by building a bigger parking areas for bigger buildings, you're kind of just ex creating more reasons for people to have to drive more. It's you can't. Anyways, I was just reading an article about that. It kind of coincided with what I was thinking about, so I could send you the article. But it's, cities are trying to cut down on the um, policies or change the policies that require minimum parking areas because they're re realizing that's only making the traffic problem worse because you're creating you're kind of creating distances between all these areas and now people are forced to drive more to get to places instead of just being able to walk to them. Um, Okay, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Ms. Marsh a question um, because I don't have the facts at hand. Um, strangely enough, um, both rec center venues, the existing one and the Dry Creek Park venue are, are in my ward and I live exactly precisely across the street from the existing uh, rec center venue. And while its parking lot is full almost all the time, um, it certainly, I wouldn't say that it's clogged up, and I know for a fact that it's not noisy. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what the, the concern is. That rec center venue has uh, relatively little uh, park area around it, whereas I understand that that this one has designated park area around it. Um, so what I would like to ask um, Joni is, first of all, um, what minima are, are being uh, planned or being applied to the parking venue? And what's the comparative size of the old rec center 
and the planned rec center, if you know. I know that's kind of putting you on the spot. Um, I, I would like to commend the, the questioner on her understanding of the pressures of new urbanism and uh, want to say that, that Longmont has also begun the process of, of eliminating parking minimums and uh, in fact are moving in certain quarters toward um, parking maximums. Thanks, Marcia. Good morning, everybody. I'm Joni, City Manager's Office. So we, we have adopted parking maximums already in the city, so we don't have any minimum requirements. Um, when the original rec center was built, it certainly did, I would say. Um, we often get more complaints that it's underparked, certainly not overparked. Um, so there won't be minimum requirements, just like there aren't in any commercial area in the city anymore. Um, and so that's been in place for, I think, three years. I think it's been a while for commercial. Um, and then the current rec center, the number escapes me, Marcia. Um, I want to say like 45,000 square feet. And I think the new one, and again, the new one isn't designed, keep this in mind, this is all conceptual at this point. It's also um, conceptual on the master plan at Dry Creek Park. So I think that including a library would be around the 65,000 square foot marker. It's kind of the, the ballpark right now. Mm -hmm. Was there something else I missed? Um, no, I think, so the the two are comparable in size. It's not, it's not, it might be 50% bigger, but it's not huge with respect to um, the existing center. Yeah, I think that we're looking for the same type of amenities in the uh, other rec center that we currently have with some addition of, you know, of pool space similar to what we have at the current rec center. So, um, but again, that's, that's not designed. Um, and we have no um, approval from voters to move forward with that rec center. So there'll be more to come. So that's right. On specifics. Yes, and so I would like to remind everybody that this is going to be a ballot question, so we will, you know, have the option of, of voting no. And another another piece of information that's kind of not quite accurate that's been going around is that this is coming out of designated open space. It is not. That city property has always been designated to be a park. And so just so it validated that what we're hearing is your biggest concern in regards to you know that uh, I call it paradise and put up a parking lot of attitude uh, that uh, you see here where uh, we have these maximum we kind of want to make sure that we we don't uh, uh, create problems for drainage and everything which is obviously our city's uh, uh, planning department's goal to make sure that we you know don't flood anybody's home or that but we also don't want to take away you know, this feeling of it being a park, I think, either. So uh, is that what you're, is that what I'm hearing from you? Yeah, I mean, I, it feels like it's, from my perspective, just seeing all the open areas, whether they're actually designated open space or just plain undeveloped areas, just seeing all that vanishing and being replaced by buildings and parking lots, it kind of starts feeling a bit claustrophobic. And it's nice having some just plain open areas they, you don't need it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just having something that's open where you can just kind of go and get a little bit break from all the buildings and parking lots everywhere. And the other thing is with all the parking lots, when you look around and see all the empty parking lots, I know there's some financial stuff that has would need to be worked out, but it just seems like there's there's areas that have already been developed. That could use, that could be used to house things like affordable housing or a rec center, rather than going out and destroying a, a area that's still kind of in a natural state, which a lot of people enjoy. And you know, yeah, there are kind of, a lot of people there are kind of horrified when they realize it's actually not designated open space, um, because for them that's one of the things they like about the neighborhood is having that. So, well. Uh, I, I should add that, that most of the most of the land to the west of you is designated open space, so you're not necessarily going to lose a lot of that feel. And that, uh, um, and again, Ms. Marsh can, can confirm this, but but uh, Longmont's overriding um, development bent right now 
is toward more infill, more density in the city core. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm not sure how serious you know, your fears are going to be, especially since even with the building in place, that designated area still has a lot of parkland around it. It's not going to be, you know, some sprawling complex that fills up the whole space that's available. So, um, but reminding everybody, this is a ballot question. You can vote on whether you think this is what the city needs or not. Thank you. And thank you for being informed. Scott. Hi, um, everybody. My name is Scott Sorry, 229 Grand Street. Um, that, um, forgive me if I'm not up to speed on the latest and greatest with uh, parking requirements or regulations or what have you. Um, but, uh, you know, I've lived here for 20 plus years and what have you. And as homeowners, it's difficult for us sometimes to keep up with what changes are happening. So please forgive us if we don't know the latest and greatest. Most of us are at a job trying to pay the mortgage and enjoy our weekends. Um, if as a homeowner I want to put an ADU and I believe it's still part of the conversation that I need to provide off street parking for my ADU unit and accommodate for that increased number of people within my property. Um, if I read the city code and I get my information from the city code and it needs to be updated, please update it. Uh, if the parking in front of my primary residence, the intent of that parking is for the dwelling unit for for that dwelling unit it's not common parking or what have you um parking is obviously a, a, a an issue online and the reason is is the um the west side tavern um the west side tavern used to operate as richards on third they had five parking spaces at the tavern um, since the tavern has gone in, uh, parking has been removed, they're down to three, and they do a valet service. They're also um, occupying the home, the, the residential home adjacent to, to um, continue parking in the residential zone. I understand the West Side Tavern has a, an exemption because this was an existing building, it was a supermarket bird or a grocery first, and then West Side Tavern. And, it has the exemption. The, the issue is the exemption used to restrict the number of seats, the number of people at the restaurant. Um, this was done for Richard and Eva, who I believe her name was Eva, was part of the uh, planning and zoning. She's communicated that Richard would have challenges because the building was already under parked if he wanted to expand. Um, yet, the current owner of this has been, as I counted, 50. Richards used to have maybe 12. And now they're seating for up to 50, according to the drawing and the code and what have you. Um, it's just, it, it's difficult. I live around the corner. They open up at four. So employees start parking in front of our half homes at four o'clock. I don't get home until after five. So what I've parked in front of my home for 20 years is now occupied by somebody that's not going to leave till after 10 o'clock in the evening because they work at the tavern. Um, this is still a residential zoned area. It is not a commercial zoned area. The entire neighborhood is residential zoned. Third Avenue is now being planned to accommodate additional parking for the tavern. I, I get it. We need parking for that. But if we're talking about, are we going to be multimodal and try to get bike lanes and everything? Third Avenue was appropriate for a bike lane. We're not even considering it because we try, we're try. we trying to do this for the tavern. And, and we're putting two stop signs within 50 yards of each other on Third Avenue because the tavern, because this gentleman has the ability to yell and scream and rally these people that he serves drinks to in order to petition for this stuff. Um, it's a neighborhood. Still got a minute, right? Okay. Um, I'll give you an example. Marsh, I know how close you live to the rec center. If they pulled the parking lot from the rec center and only allowed five cars there, how do you think that would affect your neighborhood? It would affect it pretty, pretty severely. Um, 
I, I think I'm done for now. But I, I really just don't understand what's being applied as far as the code because the guidelines are there. We're just, we just don't seem to be implementing them. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna, gonna start with, with some correcting some misunderstandings. The curbside parking in front of your house does not belong to you. I understand. Okay, well you said you said it was earlier. I said the intent of it is yeah. for the um, is for the door. It's in the code. It's written in the code. I'd really like to see that because it's been, you know, what what I was trained to believe is that is that all curbside parking is open to anyone who parks legally. Sure. Um, you know, and, and Joni's over there nodding. Yes it is. Um it's true. So uh, I'm I'm not sure where where you're coming from on that one. Um, we've um, uh, you know if if the expansion of of the number of seats uh, at the West Side Tavern, if he's seating more people than he than he should be, then. He's not. And what I'm saying is that the planning and zoning has approved for 50 seats within the tavern. It never had that. That is not historically for that property. What was was Richard's. Or please show me where Richard had the ability to seat 50 people. Please. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, defer to Joni uh, on on the code, but um, I think Sean also indicated that he had some remarks. Yeah, I, and. I hear exactly what you're saying in regards to when you, uh, uh, you you do your landscaping, you mow your lawn, you clean your uh, uh, clean the snow off the the, uh, the sidewalks in front of your house and everything like that. And the and the even if it's not written in the code, probably everybody in this room would come to the conclusion that we'd all say, well, that's that's my front uh, front spot parking, even if it's not necessarily uh, uh, written in the code. I mean, there's there's at least a perception. <laughs> I am not claiming it is. Please yeah. don't. No, no, I'm don't not saying my narrative. No, I'm not trying to. I'm saying, but, and I actually am trying to support where you're saying in the sense that that, that is the general perceived idea, whether it be uh, fact or perception. And so uh, I know how difficult it is when you have a business like this coming in and uh, having so many cars there whether it be employee cars uh, and uh, or uh, customer cars uh, in that area you still want uh, there's still that general idea that you would, would continue to do what you've done for 20 years and now it's kind of changed on you in the sense that you now they've they've got some of those things I, I don't disagree with what you're saying and, and I did have a little bit of time left so let yeah. me just read something okay a home occupation shall provide additional off seat parking area adequate to accommodate all needs created by the home occupant without changing the residential character of the premises. The tavern is a residential dwelling with a grandfathered clause that allows it to operate as a business. It needs to provide additional off street parking. Not remove it. Let's, you know the the removal of parking off street street parking um, that on on premise. Of, off on premise parking yeah. off street um, that was allowed to the West Side Tavern happened at the beginning of the pandemic when we were making all kinds of variances. Negative. It did not. It started way before that. Well, it may have, but it was permitted at that time. Um, with no notification to the surrounding neighbors within the radius that should receive a notification. Uh, so I'm going to defer on those matters of process uh, to Joni, but um, the neighborhood does have the ability to, you know, report excesses, and um, I, mean, I think he should have to have have to put his his uh, on premises parking back. He has. Um, actually done what I suggested to him, which was an unwelcome suggestion at the time, 
which is uh, rent property from parking area from neighbors and offer valet parking. It's a constructive solution. So go ahead, Joey. I'm good. I could talk all day. So I'm certainly not prepared with specific details about what's been approved or not approved um, at what's been a legal non-conforming use for as long as I've lived in Loma, um, which, as Scott said, used to be richer, very different than I think um, the transition to current um, restaurant that seems to be super popular. Not that. Very um, so I don't have the facts and details to provide the ins and outs of that. I will say that any changes for a legal non-conforming use have to go back to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and so if that has happened and there have been additional uh, entitlements granted to Richards, those are certainly on file and have been approved. If they haven't, then there is um, certainly a process by which um, the owner would need to go through to do that. And I'm happy to follow up with Glenn and his team um, to provide some of that. That's my Thank email. You, Scott. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Yeah, I, I agree with Scott for what it's worth that probably a review of, of... It's a great restaurant. I have no problem with that. But not I do all the steps right there. there. But yeah, it's great. <laughs> I said I'll never step foot right there. Why? We have what? For because reason. of the way he um, has behaved with respect to city government. As a personal, you know, I'm just not going to eat there. Uh, but uh, I, I agree with Scott that a, a review of, of that establishment's current use is uh, appropriate. Um, I've had letters from re re uh, residents and passed them on, as is my basic job, I'm just a conduit, um, to, um, uh, to, to code enforcement and to engineering, you know, to, to uh, uh, make sure that, that the complaints have been registered and have never had them closed in this particular case. Uh, so, one conversation at a time, please. Um, <laughs> so I agree that that should be done, Scott. Thank you. Um, but I, all the people who live in a neighborhood that was designed for one carriage, maybe should reconsider their three vehicle ownership to Okay, next question. Yeah, our code requires us to add parking if we added an accessory parking. We're requiring one end, and we're, you're, you're being told we have too many cars on the other end. I rode a bicycle here. Who else did? Um, Actually, a lot of people walked. I, 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 I should abide by this, this principle. So okay, good. but your time is up. When we come around Thank again, you. Scott. Thank you. Okay, next. Hi, my name is Sarah Levison. I live in the East Side neighborhood. Um, I served on city council for eight years between 2007-2015. So I know a bit about, I served with Mr. McCoy for four years. Um, so I have um, a couple requests of city council. Number one, um, there are so many taxation ballot initiatives that you guys seem to be putting on. Um, I think there's going to be a big risk that um, people are going to pick and choose and things are going to fail. Besides the one city council, one city council are going to put on. There's also a special uh, taxing district similar to um, RTD or SCFD that would be a service district to provide services for early childhood education, which is an issue I worked on the whole time was on city council. So I'm in supportive of it. I'm just not in support of at this time um, an additional taxation when. The um, state is still trying to figure out the mechanics of those extra 10 hours that they're paying for for preschool. Um, and then um, I just think that I have many neighbors that are retired, and my neighbors are going to have that have invested in their home. They're not ready to go to assisted living. Many of them don't have the resources to transition into that kind of facility. Um, they're best staying at home, and these increases of property tax will force them to leave their homes in a time period when they it's better for them overall you know to to be at home in their environment so i ask that any additional um ballot measures for taxation that you ask to be petitioned on the ballot 
Um, I know that you gave the nod to the Arts and Entertainment Center. I think that should have been petitioned because it has a, a trigger mechanism. They raise a certain amount of money and then we get debt five years later. I think most people forget about it. Um, a couple other things. Um, I'm also very concerned about the provisions of uh, the ballot proposal 123 for affordable housing that was passed statewide. Um, it, the ballot, and I've encouraged people to read the gobbledygook in it. it. If we accept money, it forces us to change our comprehensive plan, and it also um, diminishes the amount of time that anyone could speak um, on a quasi judicial matter of that piece of housing. So, uh, what will happen is we will have to change, be forced to change um, our processes for public input. Um, the money that you get from the state would pay for staff to rewrite the comprehensive plan, to rewrite the public input part for anything that's affordable housing. But again, then you're creating a more confusing system for somebody that's doing for profit housing, somebody that's doing something for nonprofit housing. How much more is that going to cause controversy in the community? Um, and my last um, uh, comments are really around the First Amendment. And I'll just take a minute and read the First Amendment. The press is here. Um, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. The, um, this provision has a long history. In 1837 to 38, there were 130,000 petitions to Congress asking for the abolition of slavery. And under pressure from the southern states, they prohibited people then from exercising their free speech right. They prohibited them from um, introducing resolutions or petitioning the government. That was overturned in 1844. Um, I think that if the city council continues on the path that um, planning and zoning um, acted on, um, you are going to have a very big lawsuit of First Amendment rights. I think you are trampling on our First Amendment rights. And we are peacefully um, speaking. As a person who filed two appeals from planning and zoning city council, won one, won, lost one, um, I really knew the process. If you're going to go back to the system, if you're going to go to a new system where anything that might be ahead might be in front, an application that might be on file since uh, 2017, as Bond Farm initially was, how are people supposed to talk? How are you supposed to guess if you come to uh, planning and zoning and the city council and say, there's an over parcel that hasn't been in annexed into the city near my neighborhood? They're going to say to you, there's no development application. They haven't had a request for annexation. Time, time. I'm sorry, I was. So, speaking. what are you supposed to do? It's irrelevant. Your speech is irrelevant at that point. Thank you, Sarah. So, um, would you like to address that one? Uh, well, I uh, no, if you can go ahead. Uh, I, I myself am still trying to uh, understand it completely and, and want to make sure that we're not getting ourselves sideways uh, with community members uh, or with the law in regards to uh, that sort of uh, uh, situation. We certainly don't want to trump on anybody's uh, First Amendment rights. And uh, I think that uh, uh, we should be able to have conversations, council members and county commission members and others, uh, hearing people out and understanding that people are uh, just trying to, you know, understand the system, understand the, the, uh, how it functions, how it works, and, and, uh, and when, when uh, we're asked certain things, I know Sarah, when she was asked certain things, she said, well, you know, I would probably go about doing it this way, you know, talking to people and finding out, you know, what the, and looking into the ordinances and looking into our, our uh, uh, municipal uh, uh, rules about, around this type of thing. And, Guiding people that way is not a, is there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's uh, the, you know some of our responsibilities here as council members. 
uh, I think uh, we're going to have to kind of feel this one out because I certainly don't want to uh, have us uh, in a situation where we're not respecting uh, our citizens' uh, right to uh, uh, communicate and, and talk to people and, and try to figure this whole complex issue out, you know. In other communities throughout the United States, people in our position here are experts in the field. We have a different sort of city council makeup and it's primarily uh, done in the West here where we have experts hired uh, like uh, Jody Marsh and others to be those uh, folks. And so the only employees that the city council uh, employs is the, uh, is the city manager, the city attorney, and the uh, city judge. And so uh, then the city manager and the city attorney go about hiring their, their staffs appropriately for managing that type of anybody, anything that's going on out there. But in other parts of the country, you'd be the expert up here. You'd be the water expert, or you'd be the electric uh, grid expert, or whatever, the, uh, or the you know collection of trash and compost and recycling expert. But that's not how we do it here. So as we try to maneuver through this, I don't claim to be the expert, is what I'm saying here to you all. I, I'm just trying to understand it as well as I can, and I'm going to be depending on our experts, whether it be our legal counsel, uh, Eugene May, uh, or our city manager, uh, guiding us through this. And I, and I hope people hear me on that, that you know, we're just as vulnerable in, in ways of not knowing exactly what uh, to do exactly correct. So we're going to be having to feel this out so that we're respectful of everybody's interests. I also acknowledge that the First Amendment says that we're allowed to address government, but it doesn't also mean that you're required to listen. I understand that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. No, well, you're not required to listen to us. You know me, sir. I always think I know everything. So um, uh, I happened to be in the, in the city manager's office when the city manager, city attorney um, showed up to uh, discuss adding the amendment to the council rules of procedure, rules of procedure that you are talking about that had already been added by the planning and zoning board and now it will be considered next Tuesday by council to limit um, communications on a specific um, matter of, of permitting uh, to the public hearing on that uh, matter. So, um, the thing that he explained to me, and then subsequently in a communication to council that probably has only come out like yesterday, yeah. um, is that the prescript prescription prescription against uh, ex parte communications uh, on a um, on a particular matter of permitting uh, is prohibited because both of the Planning and Zoning Board Commission and the City Council are at that time only in in their specific role as, as a quasi-judicial body ruling on a matter of code, which is not the typical function of council at all. We are a policy-making body. So when one of those things comes up, somebody else who is an expert um, finds the relevant statutes and reviews them with us, and then the Planning and Zoning Board provides us with their opinion, and we have very limited latitude for the kind of decisions that we can make. Similarly, although the Planning and Zoning Board is an advisory body when it comes to big matters of city planning, um, when they are ruling on a specific permit, they have the limited um, role of comparing that, um, you know, the application to existing codes and statutes. And so an ex parte communication means that somebody is lobbying or communicating with one of the stakeholders in the party, but not all of the stakeholders in the party together. And the rule is on those public hearings is that all of the evidence outside the codes has to be considered in that one single public hearing. 
So speech. Although everything in the file is considered communication, and as Commissioner Amy Saunders pointed out on Wednesday night as the dissenting voter, she said the minutes of these meetings are all, anytime you speak about anything that's a project, the references to that would go into that file. And if you'd like to go around with that, the, the, yeah. I'm sure we're going to have another time yeah. around, Sarah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Um, but um, well, we can, we, she one was a constitutional lawyer, so we'll point that out. She, she was the dissenting vote, however, um, and, uh, you know, I have to go by not the decision of a constitutional lawyer, but the decision of uh, right. the city attorney's office. Um, so that's the instructions that we have been given. It seems reasonable to me. Um, and uh, is that my five minutes being up, Sean? <laughs> we'll say <see>, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am going to wrap up by, by saying that everybody gets a chance to speak on that. And um, the opportunity, you know, there's no limit on the number of people who can speak at an official public hearing. So the same thing that was being done it, uh, off agenda uh, in the last planning and zoning meeting could actually be done in the public hearing. You could have a 12-minute presentation with three speakers, and it would be fine. So everybody gets a chance to speak. And that's what I, when people ask me, that's the sort of thing I would have said, that you can come in and talk, uh, maybe not directly, at the, the meetings ahead of time to the Transportation Board, which obviously is going to have an impact on this. You talk to the Planning and Zoning Commission, it's going to have an impact on it about how, you know, we don't have these board meetings that these boards set up just so that uh, uh, they can just uh, rubber stamp uh, all decisions and all uh, planning, uh, you know, parcels that are coming into the city. If people feel that they really don't meet the criteria or they don't uh, think that uh, it's going to uh, it's going to negatively affect the the neighborhood, they. They can they can vote in behalf of that that group of neighbors. But you and I both know that at the time that the hearing is happening, there's very little capacity for city council or any hearing officer to take in new information. Right, that's and, what I'm saying. And before. so what I'm thinking is, you should if you're if you're saying that this one meeting is the meeting, you know that you could appear in person and make an argument. If it's a new argument that you glean as a citizen from what's in the file, it's too late. That's the night of the decision. And we've said this many times to neighborhoods when we've made decisions. You are too late. We haven't seen this. We can't, this is the night to make the decision. So maybe what you need to do is change the process and take the information and then make a decision at another meeting so that that new information can be digested, okay? When I appealed to Walmart on the, the east side of town, I discovered that they were the largest polluter in construction of the Clean Water Act. There was a federal court decision in the state of Delaware prohibiting them, and yet when I discovered that information and submitted it that night, it was completely uncommon. Probably because it's, uh, probably because it's to your point, that was new information and, and people needed to digest it. Right, but that was the only, and under the, these rules, that was the only night that I could actually submit that to the council in that public forum. So we, let, let's move on to another one, uh, uh, folks, so we get through everybody, and then uh, we can come back, uh, look back into the one, the issues that are most pressing today, okay? Is that going to work for everybody? Sure. Okay, we want to be respectful of that. Yeah. So go right ahead. My name is John Pullman. I live on um, Spruce Avenue. Um, following up a little bit of what Sarah said, we're the group, we're part of the Lawn Farm neighborhood, we're the group that's been speaking up and apparently is perhaps the uh, impetus for some of these changes that are recently taking place. Um, the reason that we have tried to get in front of planning and zoning multiple times is because this issue is very complex. There's a lot of a lot of city code that, depending on depending on how it's interpreted, could lead a commission member, city council member, to either a um, 
fully endorse the developer's proposal, or B, if they if they look at the way we've been looking at it, could really call into question as to why even RMN zoning, as an example, in South of Spruce and Bound Park, why RMN zoning even would apply to that area. Uh, there are no collector or artillery streets there, they're all local streets. There is no mass transit there. You know? And so what we're trying to do is um, educate on a very complex topic that has a lot of code that could potentially apply one way or another. We're just trying to um, educate people as much as possible <laughs> that we see grave flaws in the developer's proposal at that particular piece of property. It sometimes gets misconstrued that we're against development. Some areas in Longmont, they're probably, they don't want to see, you know, they'd rather see nothing going in that piece of property or maybe something. We're like, no, we, we want high density going there, but we want it to be compatible with the neighborhood, right? We want it to have adequate parking so that we don't run into situations like, I know Scott, because Scott's my neighbor, runs into you constantly. We want to have it where there isn't canyon effects so that people in one story homes are looking at you know three and a half story homes because they have a rooftop party deck. We want to see green space in the development so that when children come down from their townhomes, they can actually play on the, on the grounds. And we're just trying to educate people. And, and, and again, to stress what Sarah said, we're really afraid that if we get one shot, one night, for five minutes or three minutes per person, that, that by that time, it's too late. Something has to change here to allow the community, because these infill developments, they're not the same as these developments on the outskirts of the city. These infill developments in the middle, I mean, our neighborhood, there are homes well over 100, 120 years old. It's, it's an existing neighborhood with a lot of character and a lot of history. And we're just scared to death that these some of these projects that are planning to go in there that, that the developers, who's always, in my understanding, is developers in constant communication with the city, right? The neighborhood, not so much. So that's that's the reason we're trying to do this. We're not trying to subvert, we're not trying to, we're not trying to um, do anything other than just make people aware that we have great concerns and we're trying to educate them. I'll stop. Um, John, I, I would like to say, first of all, that um, residents are welcome to speak on matters of policy and to address the council for policy changes and also for, you know, to give input to planning at, on a general level at any time. And we, we welcome doing that. Um, I would also like to say since I was on council when um, the, the co-housing um, project was was before us, was that at that time, we heard a lot of, dis of arguments from the Bond Farm neighborhood uh, that said that that development, which had um, approximately half the number of units that the current proposal has, was too dense and would create too much traffic through uh, through the neighborhood. Um, so maybe what the neighborhood should have been calling for and should have been calling for all along uh, and not stopped when, you know, when Spalding went bankrupt uh, was uh, changes in this, in the, in, in Spruce Street, you know, to- We actually asked to be um, down zone from R2 to R1 or RLE and the council denied um, considering that, and that was in the um, probably 2004. So the neighborhood had made an attempt, just like the Stark East Side got RLE, and now we're R1 now. Sarah, you're speaking out of turn, but the council doesn't have to um, approve every petition. The right. petition was allowed, um, and and uh, you know <laughs> that's the risk you take when you invest in property. Frankly, um, I'm not as uh, you know, not as sympathetic about this uh, because I am more sympathetic to the needs of the wider Longmont community, which which needs housing. Um, so, uh, 
I'm just I'm just saying that there are we're not curtailing all opportunities to speak. We're not curtailing the, the right to petition. Um, what we're saying is that that at certain point there is a lot there is a line between addressing matters of policy and addressing matters of uh, code compliance and and suitability of a specific app permit application. And when you cross that line, then certain restrictions go into place. They've always been there. That amendment to um, uh, both both sets of rules and procedures doesn't really change the policy. It just makes sure that everyone's aware of it. So, to the lawn farm issue specifically, the uh, it sounded like, to my understanding, and maybe Harold, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that somewhere along the line, the the bond farm folks got the impression that they uh, could have a kind of a rolling presentation uh, at at the meeting before the actual big presentation, and so they took. They, they somehow got that impression from probably city staff or city attorney, I'm getting a head nod from John, and, uh, and also from, uh, and it, there was some sort of allowance by the, the uh, chair of the Planet and Zoning Commission to say that that could, that could go forward. And so then when that happened, now all of a sudden we're just seeing this uh, issue around uh, the quasi-judicial conflict and, and problems there. Is that what I'm hearing happen? Is that your interpretation of it, John? Yeah, not attorney, but city staff. Okay, city staff. So this is this is probably one of those definite situations where there was, what do you think, Harold? Why don't you go ahead and hit it? So this is actually more of a Eugene question. Yeah. He's not here today. So um, what I understand happened was uh, during the meeting when the presentation occurred at the end of it, um, many of the planning commissioners actually were concerned about the potential crossover into the quasi-judicial world and, and pushed that question into the city attorney's office um, and kind of said, what do we do in this case and, and led to that conversation. So it was actually generated via the planning commission, my understanding, Joni, does that sound? Um, and so, and basically that's what started the conversation. Uh, then they had the item in the planning commission, the same item coming into the, the city council. It gives the chair the ability to say, we're sliding over into a quasi-judicial matter, and then they can end the conversation if it's moving into that world in consultation with the attorneys. And so um, it does have some flexibility to the point um, that Sarah, I worked with Sarah, um, we have had actually in some cases, in some, um, I don't know if you were on council when we did this, it may have been a little bit after, where the council has actually continued some of these um, cases that are appealed to them. Um, and I know this because Eugene had to kind of go through and say, we're ending uh, public invited to be heard, we're doing this. We're gonna then carry the meeting over and then the council can debate the issue amongst themselves as they're considering it. Now, if you bring in additional testimony at that point or ask questions and you have to open it up again. So I know we've gone through the process of really informing council. It doesn't need to just be done tonight. You can take it over and somewhere in Eugene's History, we have that all laid out. Is it, can you remember what it was when we did that, Joni? Probably on an appeal, I would guess. It was an so appeal was that just, and it just, yeah. Sure. It took a couple of meetings where we went through. So there is a mechanism for council to continue that conversation. But that's kind of how I was made aware of this. Um, Eugene's been talking more completely on this Tuesday night. I've already asked him to say, this is your world, not my world. I really need you to, to, to go through this process. I hope that answered some questions. Is there anyone who has not had a chance to speak? We are at 10 o'clock. Oh. 
No, sure. Hi, I know it is 10 o'clock, and I'm sorry if I'm just back here. But I, I'm sure this has been brought up. I just want to kind of, oh. I'm not sure this is brought up, but today's front page about uh, um, limiting free speech at um, planning and zoning is a, is a concern. So I just wanted to kind of weigh in that I also have that concern. So I'm sure you've already addressed it, but just want yeah. to on record. Thanks. It's it's been concerned a lot, uh, uh, discussed a lot, Sherry, and um, I mean, it will be discussed before council, and you'll have a chance to speak then. Uh, but. Uh, I think the thing that we need to all remember is that that there are times when certain speech is appropriate and times when it isn't appropriate. The First Amendment doesn't actually uh, protect that inappropriate speech. So, you know, we have a number of cases where speech is not protected by the First Amendment. The, the classic yelling fire in the theater is not protected speech unless there's a fire in the theater. Um, and uh, I, you know, I think the analogy there is obvious. Um, some some speech is always not protected. You know, hate speech we have ruled under the Constitution is is never allowed. Um, <clears throat> privately funded speech, like on a social media platform, is never allowed. We are the government, and we have the right, uh, or we have the duty, to protect speech, which means. Uh, allowing residents to petition the government, but we need to put limits on it, um, and we've, we've discussed at length that you know there are times when the speech is certain speech is appropriate and times when it's not. Um, speaking to policy, speaking to the council on policy is always appropriate outside of a quasi-judicial hearing when policy may not be changed in the context of the hearing. So, you know, Sherry, that's that's basically where, where what we're discussing is where the line between these two types of speech and venues for speech happens. And I hope that uh, Eugene will clarify that a lot more next Tuesday. Well, thank you for coming out, Sherry. We appreciate that. And uh, we always appreciate your insight on what's going on in the community and know you're a community activist and so we want to be uh we certainly uh we had just had several uh, conversations about that so just letting you know that it was uh, uh has been discussed and brought up again to marsh's point we're just trying to maneuver through this uh, we're all uh, kind of learning a little bit uh more about you know how to how to how to handle this we want to handle it right respectfully and uh and without uh, stepping on anybody's uh, uh, rights, First Amendment rights. Wouldn't you agree there, Sarah? Yeah, well, you know, to my people, when we tried to make new um, election law policy, we got hauled into federal court, justice and court in, um, in uh, Denver. You know, those people thought their free, re free speech rights were being trampled on, so we backed off. Well, Gene we'll, was city attorney during that. We'll, we'll, you know, uh, sometimes uh, uh, trying to do the right thing uh, uh, from a governmental standpoint sometimes comes across that somehow you're you're doing the wrong thing. But I, I really think that the, the spirit of the council is that to do the right thing uh, by the community, uh, by the community, and making sure that everybody's voice is heard. And uh, I know that I'll continue to be out there talking to you. I know that Marcia will be too. And, and uh, you know the best thing that we can do is just hear each other out and make sure that uh, we're all uh, you know being respectful as we do that. So, if there's is there anybody else that would like to speak today? I'd just like to say thank you. I know you folks have other things you could be doing on your Saturday morning, and I appreciate the fact that you're here for listening. Thank you, Steve. That's it's very nice to go out on a on a high note. And, and I want to thank you all for coming, uh, and and more for coming well prepared. Um, I, it especially warms my heart to see what someone speak in favor of eliminating parking and and uh, uh, promoting urban density. So um, thank you in particular, ma'am. I'm sorry I forgot your name. Anne. Anne. Anna. 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 But you're welcome. <laughs> and. Uh, 
Uh, thank you all for coming out. It looks like it might be a nice morning, so have a good time. Yeah. Thank you.